Okay, we got to start out with a question or a survey because it's summertime and you know we're we're all about you know the picnics and the barbecues and food, right? You know, we, we as humans like food, but uh, the question is is which fruit do you like? Raspberries. Raspberries, yeah. I'm waiting for the raspberries to set on. They're, they haven't arrived yet. I'm hoping that last frost didn't get them. Yeah. Yeah. Juicy peaches. Juicy peaches, oh yeah. Did anybody like tree ripe peaches? Yeah. The kind where you walk up to the tree and you can almost, you know, just suck them right off the, the stem. Growing up, we had a pear tree like that out in Washington State, and tree ripe pears. I mean, it's, it, it, I mean, you get those green things in the store, and it's like crunch, crunch, crunch. Oh, no, that ain't a, that ain't a good fruit. No, I mean, we we all have our favorites, right? For different reasons, you know, the seasons. You know, you know, as the the, the year progresses, you know, it becomes watermelon season. Watermelon. Oh yeah, good good ripe watermelon. I'm hungry. Should we just? you know, adjourn and go find some fruit. <laughs> What's that? Strawberries. Strawberries, yeah. Some good juicy ones, right? Mm -hmm. Not those big woody ones that you get sometimes that are crunchy. Mm -hmm. you know, something about crunchy fruit, that just doesn't sound right, right? <laughs> okay, uh, which fruit don't you like? Kiwi. Kiwi? Papaya. Papaya. Sticks. <laughs> you don't like the little fuzzy kiwis? No? Okay. Persimmon. Persimmon? <laughs> we, we had that last night, too. Somebody said persimmons. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of fruit out there that's like, why? Why would you even raise this? You know? Some of that stuff that comes from the tropics. Dragon fruit. Dragon fruits and all that. I'm sure there's a good one out there someplace. I just haven't found it yet. So. But yeah, no, we have good fruits and bad fruits like you know what we like. But of course, we're in church right now. So we're not talking physical fruit. We're going to talk spiritual fruit here because we all know what the, the fruit of the Spirit is, right? Yes. What, what, what is it? Love, joy, peace, kindness, gentleness, long-suffering. Meekness. Meekness. And that one everybody loves? Self-control? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, you know, there's a whole list there. So which one of those do you like, you love? Kindness. Kindness? You like kindness? Okay, that's a good fruit. Love. love. Joy. Joy? Oh, yeah, you know. Peace and peace. <laughs> we all like those, right? I have to agree with the peace one. You know, I, I really like peace because that's something we're blessed with here in this valley. You know, we can live in peace, you know. Yeah, we have our problems, you know, that, that person that gets under our skin every now and then or yes. in this situation. But you know what, when it's all said and done, you know, we, we went to Idaho Falls just the other day and you get in there and you hear all the noise and the people and the just all the angst that's going on. It's like, I'm ready to go home. Mm -hmm. Self-control. Self-control, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, self-control. Don't let me think or do what I'm thinking right now. I'm going to go home. <laughs> So now the next question is, is which fruit don't you like? Is there any in there that uh, maybe you say, I don't like that one? I have a hard time with self-control. struggle with. Not <laughs> struggle, struggle with? Self okay. Self-control. Self-control. Well, let me remind you where we were last week. We were in Romans chapter 12. And verse 12 of Romans 12, I'll let you turn there if you want. It's just... just uh, let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 10 words. We should be able to remember that, right? Romans 12, 12 says, Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. How many of you like patience? Patience. Uh, do you struggle with patience like I do? Sometimes. Sometimes. Yes. You know, we pray, Lord, this is what I want and I want it now. <laughs> you know, Lord, it's been 10 minutes. Where are you? <laughs> you know, patience is one that I think a lot of people struggle with. Yeah. You know, people have prayed, Lord, give me patience. And then they find out how you get patience. 
you know, be careful what you pray for. But, you know, patience is one of the fruit of the Spirit. You know, it, it yields patience in our lives. And, and what are we to have patience with or for or who? You know, well, it's everything that God would have patience with. Has he had patience with us? Oh, boy. Oh, boy, yeah, yeah. He's long-suffering with me, you know. But patience. Let, let's look at this topic just a little bit. So we're going to start out tonight in, in Isaiah chapter 26, if you'll turn there with me. Isaiah chapter 26. We'll start out at verse 1. Because God has had such great patience with us, I think we can learn a lot from our Lord. But also, there's a certain little nation that God has had great patience with too. And they're, you know, it's the nation of Israel. He has been long-suffering with them. You know, we, we've been going through the book of Zechariah, and we see what God still has in store for that nation. You know, don't ever let anybody tell you that God's done with the nation of Israel. That's right. You know, he still has many, many things that he has promised them. And we know God, when he promises something, he delivers it. So we're going to start out in verse 1 of, of the Isaiah 26. And now Isaiah is talking here about a really lighthearted subject. It starts out in chapter 24 and it says, See, the Lord is going to lay waste the earth and devastate it. He will ruin its face and scatter its inhabitants. Nice little light subject, right? Okay, and now we're to, to verse or to, uh, to chapter twenty-six, and it's a song of praise, and and really this is a song that's coming from the nation of Israel. It's, it's going to be, and it says, "In that day, this song will be sung in the land of Judah. We have a strong city. God makes salvation it, its walls and ramparts. Open the gates." that the righteous nation may enter, the nation that keeps faith. Are, are we sure we're talking about the same nation, right? The nation of Israel, the, the righteous nation? Well, remember, God declared us righteous too. And it wasn't by our actions or our deeds. It was by the blood of his son that was shed for us that were declared righteous when we accept him as Lord and Savior. He's that atoning sacrifice for us, and he's going to be that atoning sacrifice for them too. Because he's still their, their cho they're his chosen people. And it's good. notice it said there that, the, the, that God makes salvation its walls and ramparts. You know, it, it's not by their might you know, they're going to be, you know, this protection. We see that going on even to today. You know, God is, is the strength of Israel because it's a little tiny thing as far as nations go. Mm -hmm. You know, but, but it, it's a mighty force to be reckoned with even to this very day. Mm -hmm. Notice in verse 3, he says, You will keep in perfect peace him whose mind is steadfast, because he trusts in you. Now, in the Bible, we have a lot of passages that apply to us. They may not be written directly to us, but they're, they show us the nature of God. Because he never changes. And here he says, you, you will keep in perfect peace him whose mind is steadfast because he trusts in you. Perfect peace. You know, the, one of the things that I think when people ask, you know, you know, what, you know, what's going on in your life? Why are you so, you know, aren't you upset with all the things going on in the world right now? No. I have peace right now. I have peace with God because of what Jesus has done. But I also know that he's still in control. And none of this is catching God by surprise. It's just basically putting into motion those things that he said, this is what it's going to look like in those end times. But, you know, the, the question is, is do you, you know, do you allow God to give you that perfect peace? That, that's one of the things I think that the enemy is working overtime on right now is to keep the world stirred up, <coughs> to, to cause us to be divided, to cause, uh, you know, all this animosity between groups of people and, and you know, racism. 
you know, we thought we'd done something really good back in the 50s and the 60s, and now racism is flaring its ugly head. Why? Because it's, it's dividing people. Mm -hmm. The enemy can't stand it when we're united, especially the church. So what did he do but cause people to break out into different denominations because it's a division of the church. You know, you guys don't worship right. Well, you guys don't pray right. Well, you guys don't read the right Bible. Well, you got, you know, I mean, all that stuff. But notice it says, God, you know, you will keep in perfect peace him whose mind is steadfast. See, right now, you know, the world is being, you know, inundated with all sorts of things. And here, you know, we have to keep our <coughs> minds steadfast about what God has said. He isn't done with Israel, and he hasn't done with the church, and he isn't done with us. He's still our God. And he's promised that he'll never leave us or forsake us. And he dwells inside of us. We were talking about that the other day, and you know, I, the enemy can get you to that point where you can say, I hope I never hear, you know, I never knew you, but he knows us. Mm -hmm. He lives inside of us. So we have that perfect peace knowing, Lord, you know me. You know what I'm capable of, and you still love me. And you forgave me, and you still forgive me. He's not going to come to that point in life where he goes, I'm done with you, you know, no, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Mm -hmm. I don't know about you, but you know, we can experience peace with God. And that's something the world doesn't have right now, that's right. is that peace. In verse 4, it says, Trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord, the Lord is the rock eternal. Who do you trust? God. Do you trust the government? No. Uh, politicians? No. Your boss? You know, human beings? No. We, we trust in the Lord forever. And that's one of those things, do you really trust him? You know, the problem is, is you know, sometimes we, we lean on our own understanding, don't we? We're told to trust in the Lord with all our heart and lean not unto our own understandings. In all our ways acknowledge him, and he will direct our paths. Now, now I'm not preaching at you. I, I'm reminding myself out loud. Okay? Trust in the Lord forever. He's got this. He's got us. Verse 5 says, He humbles those who dwell on high. He lays the lofty city low. He levels it to the ground and casts it down to the dust. Feet trampled it down, the feet of the oppressed, the footsteps of the poor. The city, you know, he, he's talking about Jerusalem here. It, it became very proud of itself. Remember, you know, before Babylon came, that, you know, they were all, they thought they were invincible. We're God's chosen people. Nothing bad will ever happen. Well, then Rome. Remember, we have the temple, you know, and God, we're still God's chosen people. And, and God finally had to humble them to the point where he dispersed them. He humbles those who dwell on high. And that's also something, I don't know about you, but I've seen God do that to, to many people around the world even to today. You think you're something special? You think you're God's gift to this world? Hang on. Yeah. He's got a way of bringing you down a notch or two. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes he has to take you and lay you flat out on your back on a hospital bed to finally get you to look up and go, Lord, I need you. Mm -hmm. he, he can humble you. Verse 7, it says, The path of the righteous is level. O upright one, you make the way of the righteous smooth. Now, you know, we're never promised that everything is going to be smooth sailing as far as there, there's still things that we have to go through. But here he says the, the path of the righteous is level. It means that, you know, God has provided that path to righteousness. It's not like you have to climb the great mountains to ascend it. 
Jesus is there. He was, he was fully man, and he presented himself to us. You know, you know, other religions, they, you know, you got to ascend the heights of, uh, of human morality before you can be enlightened and all this other stuff. No. <laughs> Everybody has the same opportunity. Mm -hmm. and, and the path to Jesus, he's right there. In, in Revelation 3.20, he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. That's how close he is. Mm -hmm. He wants us to let him in. And as believers, that's what we had to do. We had to let him come into our hearts. Okay? Verse 8, Yes, Lord, walking in the ways of your laws, we wait for you. Your name and renown are the desires of our hearts. You, you get the idea there that we wait for you. There's that P word embedded in that idea there, that patience. <coughs> Have you ever had to wait on the Lord? Yes. Pray and pray and pray, and it seems like nothing is being answered, but yet God is faithful. We wait upon him in his perfect will. It says, but walking in the ways of your laws, or your version may say judgments, we wait for you. Now, this isn't saying that we have to go back under the Mosaic law, because you and I have been released from the, 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 the law of sin and death, and we've been brought under the law of love. How many Christians are walking in love? Or are, are waiting in God in love? Now, some Christians are just waiting. For what? They don't know. You know, they're sitting in the pew waiting. I'm waiting for a good sermon, or I'm waiting for this, or I'm waiting for that. You know, waiting for a good program to come up. No, that ain't the idea. We're waiting upon him, serving him. Okay? We wait for you. Your name and renown are the desires of our hearts. I've got that one underlined because I have to think about it. What's the desire of my heart? Well, it should be, right? What's the desires of your heart? A new boat? Big truck? Fancy house? You know, the, it, here it, it's saying that, you know, your name and renown. That should be the, the desire of the church. Not to build numbers and, and to, to build a bigger building and to have fancier things. It's the renown of God that we should be desiring to see him glorified. See, the problem is, I think there's a lot of churches out there, they couldn't care about that. They don't care about that. It's all about them. You know, look at us. We're better than you because, you know, look at all this stuff. We've got to be closer to God than you. Yeah, no. Exactly. Material things don't draw you closer to God. In fact, they do just the opposite. They draw you away from God, and they can cause divisions. Mm -hmm. I've joked about it in the past, but it's the truth. Even in churches, you know, something as silly as the color of the carpet has divided churches and, and split them. Mm -hmm. Well, it should be red to signify the blood of Christ. No, it should be white to indicate the purity. It should be, no, you know, symbolisms. They drive me nuts because it's not, it, we're not told to, to do those things. There's only really a couple things that the church is enjoined to, to remember. One was his death, you know, you know and, 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 and through baptism. And the other was the, you know, the, his death and resurrection and the, the new covenant that's found in the Lord's Supper. Those are the things we're supposed to remember and to do. But man adds to it. Kind of, we looked at that last week, remember? All the different rituals and things like that. Those are, you know, it was a couple weeks ago. You know, the nation of Israel had been uh, doing all sorts of fasts because of the destruction of the temple and of, of the surrounding of Jerusalem and the besieging of it. And they were doing all these fasts. And God's like, who are you doing those for? Was it for me? And he says, I never told you to do those things. So, you know, for your name and renown are the desires of our heart. He goes on, he says, my soul yearns for you in the night. 
In the morning, my spirit longs for you. What do you got a yearning and a hankering for? Is it God? Again, I'm not preaching here. I'm reminding myself. It's, it's, you know, when we find ourselves desiring the, st- the things of this world, our desires are misplaced. Because all that stuff fades away. You know, I would challenge you. Think back maybe 30 years ago to something you said, I just got to have this. This, this is the most important thing in my life. Where is it now? Probably in the landfill or in the closet. Probably haven't seen the light of day in 20 years, right? You know, for us, it should be, you know, our soul yearns for him, you know, and it longs for him. You know, I mean, this sounds like a psalm from David. And it should be our song to him. Lord, I long for you. But again, this is going to be the, this is going to be the nation of Israel in the, in, in the millennial reign. But it should also represent what the church desires just today. <clears throat> he continues on in verse 9. He says, When your judgments come upon the earth, the people of the world learn righteousness. Though grace is shown to the wicked, they do not learn righteousness. Even in a land of uprightness, they go on doing evil and regard not the majesty of the Lord. You know, again, nation of Israel. You know, they don't learn righteousness. They, you know, back in the day, they had the glory of God with them. And they still didn't learn righteousness. They were all about the ritual. Not realizing God had provided a way that they could be in right standing with him. It was all about the sacrifices. And it was all about the temple worship and everything else. Instead of worshiping the one who had, had, had spelled out for these things to be made to reflect heavenly things. And it says, you know, they go on doing evil and regard not the majesty of the Lord. You know, again, the nation of Israel. They didn't regard the majesty of the Lord. And and sad thing is, is there's a lot of churches out there. They don't regard the majesty of the Lord. His preeminence. Christ is supposed to be the head of the church, not the pastor. If it's the pastor, they got the wrong head. They should have a headectomy done and, and get the right one going. Verse 11, O Lord, your hand is lifted high, but they do not see it. Let them see your zeal for your people and be put to shame. Let the fire reserved for your enemies consume them. There's a good prayer for the nation of Israel even to today. You know, he said, you know, let them see your zeal for your people and be put to shame. With what's going on with Israel right now, that's our prayer, is that the world would see God's glory magnified through his people. To see his zeal for that nation that still rejects him. But he has promised the, the patriarchs, he's promised David that, you know, of, of things to come. Again, you think, people think that God's done with, God, uh, with the nation of Israel. They need to read Zechariah. There's a lot of promises there that God still has in store for his people. But Lord, let them see your zeal for the, your people. Because you know what? The world right now is like, oh, we got them cornered. We're going to take them out. You know, it's a matter of time and they're going to fall. No, you haven't seen nothing yet because God's going to show his mighty hand soon. But then the world will just discount it once again. Mm -hmm. Oh, they just got lucky. (laughs) Really? You know, you think about the wars that Israel's already been involved in in just this century. Mm -hmm. Luck had nothing to do with it. It was God's divine hand protecting them. But again, we're to be patient and wait upon the Lord for all these things. He's not done yet. Yeah, thank goodness. So I'd like to look at one more passage, if you would. Turn with me to Psalm 37. This 37th Psalm. 
Oops. That's why I was in the wrong book. It does. When nothing looks right, you might want to see where you're at. Psalm 37 is a psalm of David. And, and, and he's going to address the same issue. But we'll start out at verse 1. And it says, Do not fret because of evil men, or be envious of those who do wrong. For like the grass, they will soon wither. Like green plants, they will soon die away. Do not fret. Any, anybody in here ever fretted about something? <laughs> with politics, with what's going on in the world right now? I mean, there's a lot of things that we could fret over. That word fret, it's kara. It's to burn or to be kindled with anger, to heat oneself to vexation. You know, that agitation that the world can provide. All it takes for me is to listen to some of these newscasts of seeing all these people that are up there, you know, parading themselves around defying God. And yeah, I get a little bit fretted. But even God says here, don't fret. Because they're going to disappear like the grass. I don't know about you, but in the last couple of weeks here in Idaho, have you noticed that the, brown, or the grass has changed colors? It went from a nice green to a really brown color. Dry and crunchy. Didn't take that long to happen, did it? It's amazing what a little lack of water can do. Well, God says that's the way that evil men will be. They're going to wither and they're going to fade. All the stuff that's going on on, on the, the steps of our Capitol buildings and in being paraded through the schools and everything else, it's going to disappear soon. Because God is still who he says he is. And he's going to hold men accountable for these things. So don't fret. It's not like the enemy's going to win. He's already defeated. When Christ rose from the dead, the last enemy to be defeated is death. And Christ defeated that enemy. Verse 3. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the, la the land and enjoy safe pasture. Now, our promises aren't based upon the land. The nation of Israel, their promises lie in their land. Mm -hmm. David was speaking to the nation of Israel. He's saying here, trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Okay. The, the, the principles here that I think we can apply to ourselves is trust in the Lord and do good. See, our promise isn't in the land. Our promise is in our Savior. It's an individual relationship for each and every one of us. And that's right now, that's our promised land that we dwell in. We can have peace with God. We don't have to worry about what's going on. Yes, we, we need to be... Um, Standing for the truth. We, we need to be steadfast and immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, but don't worry. God is going to use those very things for those people to convict them of what they are doing when we stand for the truth. We don't have to do it in meanness. We can do it in love. We can tell them about the peace that we have with God. I've been reconciled back to God and I have a promise of eternity with him. And they may or may not receive the message. Hey, I've been forgiven of my sins. They may or may not receive that message. What are we to do? Trust in the Lord and do good. What do you trust? You know, Sometimes we, we trust our vehicles, you know, to get us from point A to point B. I've had to make a lot of phone calls. Uh, hon, can you come and get me? It broke down again. <laughs> Ever had to make calls like that? <laughs> Did you trust that vehicle? Yeah, I got in it. It was going to get me there and back. It didn't make it. 
Verse 4 says, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. What do you delight in? Do you delight in people seeing God's glory? And delight in people seeing the truth? See, when you delight in the Lord, he's going to give you the desires because you delight in him. When we pray, we pray in Jesus' name because we're saying, Lord, I know this is something that you would have prayed for. So I'm praying for it also in your name. We represent him. It's not the magic you know, phrase that we put on the end to get whatever we want. And same thing here, delighting in him, he will give you the desires of your heart. It, it, it's not saying that he's going to give you the Mercedes or, or the mansion. Because guess what? While Jesus was here, he didn't ride around in a chariot. He walked everywhere. And he didn't live in a mansion. He had, as he said, he had no place to lay his head, meaning he had no home. But you know God gave him the delights of his heart because he delighted in seeing the Father glorified. Mm -hmm. Commit your ways to the Lord. Trust in him and he will do this. He will make your righteousness shine like the dawn, the justice of your cause like the noonday sun. Commit your ways to him. It goes back to that trust. You know, Lord, I don't know how you're going to fix this, but I know you're going to fix it. Lord, I know you're going to keep me. Because we know that his word is a light unto our feet and a, a, a lamp unto our path. He guides us. If we commit our ways, it's like, Lord, I may not be able to know where we're going, but you do. See, we can't even see over the next hill. It amazes me when we travel to Idaho Falls, how many people will pass not knowing what's over the next hill. It's usually an oncoming truck. Well, guess what? We don't know what tomorrow brings. We get all worried about, well, I got this to do and that to do and this to do and that to do. Well, guess what? Life can happen in a moment. We might find ourselves on a whole different path tomorrow. So commit our ways to him. Lord, I'm yours. I trust you. Now, we say that, but the problem is, is do we believe that? Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct thy paths. He will make your righteousness shine like the dawn. Well, I have no righteousness of my own, but I have Christ's righteousness inside of me. And that's what he'll make known. You know, I'm in right standing with God. That's something you and I can tell other people about. Oh, you think you're something special? No, I'm not. I'm a sinner saved by grace. But I'm in right standing with God because of what Jesus did for me. And I can, they, they can think whatever they can, you know, want to think about that. But that's your testimony. God's done this for me. The justice of your cause, like the noonday sun. What's our cause? Serving What's that? Serving him. Serving him, yeah. Hopefully our, our cause isn't to, to, you know, feed strays, you know, or something like that. We could do those things. That, that's great, you know. But our cause should be the things that, you know, our convictions, you know, our... our that which is most important to us, and that should be Christ in eternity. Mm -hmm. Verse 7, be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. There's that P word again. Be still before him. That quietness, Lord, I know you're in control. Lord, I don't have to come to you all worried about the fact that I need to tell you about what's going on in the world. You already know. Lord, I trust you. You're going to do that which will bring you honor and glory. Right. Not me. 
See, my problem was, you know, a lot of times I, I pray those prayers, that, Lord, I want, you know, it's all about me. No, Lord, this is all about you. I want you to be glorified. I want people to see your mighty hand at work. You know, one of those prayers, you know, I think about Moses. When he was up there on the mountain, and he, you know, he was getting the, the Ten Commandments the second time. And he asked, Lord, let me see your glory. And the Lord said, well, you can't see my face, but I'll put you in the cleft of the rock and I'll cover you there with my hand. And then after I pass by, you'll be able to see me, see my glory. That's something I think we could pray to, Lord. I want them to see your glory. Whether it be the nation of Israel, our family, or this valley, Lord, I want them to see your glory and not us. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret when men succeed in their ways, when they carry out their wicked schemes. I think that's very uh, appropriate as we enter into this election seasons. You know, don't fret about those things. God will put into control who he wants there. We pray, Lord, that it's a godly man. It's godly men and women in our, in our leadership positions. Mm -hmm. But Lord, you know exactly what this nation needs. Two more verses here. He says, refrain from anger and turn from wrath. Do not fret. It leads only to evil. You know, when we get to worrying and fretting and getting stewing about things, remember that. It only leads to evil. Mm -hmm. For evil men will be cut off, but those who hope in the Lord will inherit the land. For the nation of Israel, that's what God was promising them. They're going to inherit the land, but you and I have a better promise. We're co-heirs with Christ. We inherit everything that is Christ's with him. That's a better promise than just land because he's been given everything. And he includes us when we put our faith and our trust in him. So I would encourage you. Yeah, that P word, patience. You know, that, to me, that's that fruit I don't like. It's kind of got that bitter taste to it every now and then, doesn't it? But, you know, the Lord says, be patient. I'm still at work. And he's at work in our lives, too, each and every day. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for the time we can spend with you. And Lord, help us to, to keep our eyes focused only on you. Not the situations in the, in the world around us, not all the wickedness and the, the, the things that are going wrong, but Lord, the, the promises that you have for us. And Lord, help us to be faithful in prayer and to be steadfast about your ways, Lord, to, to not compromise, but to Lord, to glorify you in everything that we do. And our prayer, Lord, is that you will be glorified through your church and through our lives. We ask, Lord, that you'll continue to just strengthen us through your spirit and quicken our minds so that we can be a blessing to you, Lord. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' wonderful and precious name. Amen. Amen.